Welcome to the Less True podcast presented by Gulf Food, the largest annual FMB sourcing event in the world. I'm your host, Jeraria Hersey, bringing you compelling stories and insights to a wide range of topics in the food and drinks industry, from farming, behind the scenes, to the culinary world, and to foods we simply love to chew on. In this podcast series, we speak to people, brands, and businesses across the food and drinks spectrum to find out more about why they do what they do and how, in their own way, they're championing change and shifting the future of food and drink. Trust me, there's so much more. So listen to the Less True podcast on our website, gulffood.com, and subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates in food. Welcome to the Less True Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Hersey, and on today's episode, we have a phenomenal guest with us, Indidi Okonko Oneli, an expert on social innovation, African agriculture and nutrition, entrepreneurship, and youth development. She has over 25 years of international development experience and is a recognized serial entrepreneur, author, public speaker, and consultant. Over the years, she has focused exclusively on transforming the African agriculture and nutrition landscape through her work as the executive chair of Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition, co-founder of Ace Foods, founder of Nourishing Africa, and her latest startup, Changing Narratives, Africa Committed to Changing Global Mindsets About Africa. Thank you for joining us uh, in Didi. It's a great pleasure to have you on our podcast today. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the good work you do. Thank you. So uh, let's get started. Um, You wear many hats in the agriculture and food landscape, which shows your true passion for the industry. How did you venture into the agriculture sector and what did the journey look like in becoming an expert and the voice of African agriculture? It's amazing because my favorite subject in high school was agriculture. I grew up in the southeastern part of Nigeria in a small town called Enugu and my parents are university professors so we had a little garden behind a house and I loved growing vegetables, we loved picking fruits and even had my first commercial transaction taking a bag of avocados to the market when I was 12. But I think the stereotype around food and agriculture deterred me from studying it. You know, everyone said, you can't go to school to study agriculture. It's a poor man's profession. And so I chose to study business as my first and second degree. I went to the Watson School in Harvard. And it's interesting because when I moved to America, I was confronted with an image that really made me angry. The face of Africa that was shown to me was a hungry child. I would go to dinner parties, people would tell me, oh, when I was your age, my parents used to say, finish your dinner, they are starving children in Africa. I would go to um, train stations and see, you know, fundraising campaigns, give $10 a day to feed a child in Eritrea or in Ethiopia, or in this day, South Sudan. And those made me really angry. That face of Africa was not one that I had seen. It was not one I identified with. Um, and it, it made me so angry that I wanted to do something about it. So I've devoted my life to really not only trying to change narratives, but also trying to improve the productivity of our farmers, the efficiency of our ecosystems to ensure that we as Africans can feed ourselves and feed the world. Um, and I believe we're naturally endowed for agricultural excellence on this continent. We have everything um, on the continent, the right soil, the right temperatures, water, Um, so much going for us in this sector. And we just have to maximize the potential of the sector. And we have so much to teach the world. Uh, So that's what I've devoted my life to through the different hats I wear at Ace Foods, Sahel Consulting, Nourishing Africa, and most recently, Changing Narratives Africa. It's been an amazing journey, lots of learnings, lots of highs and lows, but I have no regrets for devoting my life and the best part of my adult years to this sector. That's amazing. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the work you do as Sahel Consultancy and how it's transforming the African agriculture and the nutrition landscape? And also, if you can tell us the the narratives that you're tackling in your startup, your latest one, Changing Narratives Africa, and how so are you doing that with food? So with Sahel Consulting, Sahel is 12 years old and we work across Africa, but with a focus on West Africa, transforming the food and agricultural landscape. 
and we have a number of interventions. First, we do a lot of value chain analysis, looking at where the opportunities to maximize our productivity, our efficiency, and to close the bottlenecks in key value chains. So we've done a lot in the yam value chain, cassava, rice, maize, and now dairy. We have also launched some ecosystem solutions, actually commercialized research, all the great research that goes on in our research institutions around drought resistant varieties, uh, seeds that are you know, uh, climate resilient. And that research has to be commercialized, meaning the private sector has to adopt it and it has to get into the hands of farmers and has to improve the lives of everybody through the value chain. So what we've helped uh, with the support of funders like the Gates Foundation is actually create seed companies that com commercialize this research. So we did the business plans, recruited the board, and uh, basically the startup team to get these seed companies off the ground in different value chains. We've also launched ecosystem solutions where we're basically going in to solve problems in the entire value chain. And we're doing this in dairy through the Advancing Local De Development in Dairy in Nigeria project, Aldine. And what we're doing through this project is basically not only shaping policy to ensure that we have an enabling environment for the dairy industry, but improving the productivity of our local cows, ensuring that our communities of entrepreneurs can maximize the potentials in their sector through providing access to artificial insemination services, vet care, um, infrastructure such as solar pod boreholes and milk collection facilities, and then linking these dairy farmers with processors who make yogurts and cheese and other critical um, products for the industry. And so it's been an amazing project, a multi-year project, private sector driven with all the policymakers transforming the entire ecosystem and creating jobs. And what's so exciting about dairy is that in our culture, uh, the Fulani communities here, women typically own the milk and men own the cows. So there's a big gender empowerment component for these communities. Um, there's also a nutrition component where you're ensuring that they can improve the nutritional status of their children and the communities that do consume the milk and the milk byproducts that are created. But there's also a security component because then these traditional nomadic communities actually settle down and have businesses. Then there's a financial inclusion component where we're helping them get bank accounts and be linked up using their cell phones to their financial transactions. So it's just an amazing, amazing ecosystem solution. And the Harvard Business School actually did a case study on this project called Aldine. So we've been now teaching students all over the world about what it takes to transform dairy sector in one country. Um, beyond that, we do a lot of training. We are currently training the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development staff to improve their awareness of critical issues such as climate change um, and how to develop policy and strategies to ensure that our, our country is food self-sufficient and that we can actually surmount many of the obstacles around uh, shocks um, and also teaching them about technology and the power of big data to inform data-driven policy making. So there's a whole stream of activities around training um, the talent for the sector. And then we do a lot of research. We've done a lot of research on the Africa continental free trade zone and how food entrepreneurs can maximize this. We've done a lot of research on the role of women and youth in the agriculture value chain on climate and how entrepreneurs can really maximize the opportunities to address the climate crisis in the food ecosystem. And the list goes on and on. So that's Sahel Consulting in a nutshell. Um, Changing Narratives Africa is really new. It was just started last year. And I started it primarily to address this challenge that we have when, that when we think of Africa, we think of a hungry child. And Changing Narratives is focused on not only celebrating Africa's contributions to the global food ecosystem, but ensuring that more people globally experience the diversity, the richness, and the amazing cuisine from Africa. So we've done a number of things. Now, number one, we're actually leveraging media to tell positive stories about how Africa has contributed to the global food ecosystem. And that's why the media is such a powerful tool. Um, telling stories like the power of Africa in terms of co co chocolates or coffee. So I'll use an example. Our first podcast is called Crazy for Coffee Embraces Roots. Most people don't know around the world that coffee was born in Ethiopia and that 18 countries in Africa produce some of the world's best coffee. They don't know that 70% of the world's chocolate is from just two countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, and that we have amazing chocolates here. It's right here in our continent. They don't know that Coca-Cola was made with cola nuts 
from West Africa. The first recipes were made with cola nuts from West Africa. So if you've had a Coke or coffee today, you have Africa to thank for it. Similarly, okra, which is a great vegetable, highly nutritious, is actually an Igbo word. Um, Igbo is my language from Southeastern Nigeria. And this word has been adopted by the, the entire globe um, as the word for this vegetable. It was first found in the colony of Virginia in the 1600s, taken through the transatlantic slave trade to the Americas. And that's why today seafood okra from southeastern Nigeria is almost identical to gumbo from New Orleans in the United States. And it just shows how our culture and our cuisine has influenced global cuisine in South America, in Asia, in Europe, across the Americas, because our people really created food. Um, and our people have a lot to teach the world about healthy diets, about protective foods. And everybody who's worried about gut health, you know, should look to the Hadzibe people of Tanzania, who eat 10 times more fiber than the average American, um, who are at peace with their environment because whatever they grow is sourced from the environment and they respect the environment. Um, and there's so much we can learn from African cuisine. So that's been the big push for changing narratives Africa. The second is actually getting our products on global shelves. We have some of the best food in the world, but many people don't realize it. And we've been so inspired by what the Japanese have done with sushi in just 20 years. Sushi has gone from being a novelty food to being a mainstream product in grocery stores across every little city and state in the world. Um, we want to do that with our food. We want jollof rice to be as popular as sushi, and we want teff to be as popular as white flour. And we want um, all our products. I mean, the, the list is so long, so many, so many, so many products. Fonio to be as popular as quinoa. Um, because we have healthy food and the rest of the world really should embrace this food because it's good for you. It's, you know, rich in all sorts of micronutrients and it's affordable. And when you buy food sourced from Africa, you're improving the lives of so many people across the value chain. Um, so we're actually helping our entrepreneurs get onto global shelves. We launched a narrative changer food fellowship where we've been training entrepreneurs and getting them on global platforms so that the rest of the world can enjoy proudly Nigerian, proudly Senegalese, proudly Ethiopian, proudly South African food. And then the final thing is convenings. We're linking entrepreneurs in the West to entrepreneurs in Africa so that they can build bridges, they can share knowledge, they can build bonds, and that they can influence each other positively. We believe food connects in ways that not many other things do. Food is life. Food is, is just a powerful tool for building understanding. And that's what we're focused on with Changing Narratives Africa. Sure. So could you tell us some of the biggest barriers confronting your mission to develop strong, sustainable agriculture across Africa that you've come across so far? Well, there are lots of barriers. I would say number one is really around infrastructure. Um, we still have a huge infrastructure deficit around our continent, um, not only in terms of access to roads and feeder roads, because many of our countries were designed as you know, export-based countries where we're exporting commodities. So infrastructure from farm to markets is still very poor. Um, in addition, trade within our continent is still quite difficult. So through the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, we're hopeful that that will change. So infrastructure is a huge barrier. Another barrier is really around climate change. African countries are not huge contributors to the climate challenge we have right now in the world, but seven out of 10 of the countries most affected by climate change are in Africa. And the food ecosystem is a direct contributor to climate, but also huge, huge burden when it comes to the droughts, the flooding, the locust infestations, you know, and I, the list goes on. And our farmers are affected. Um, and this definitely not only creates in, um, instability, but prevents planning and investment, and oftentimes has even set us back. Just last year, five states in Nigeria were covered with water. And this meant that all the investments in farmlands and, and the production for the year was destroyed. Um, and so we need to get ahead of this problem on the continent. We already have great innovations around seed systems, around technology, around the use of data, but we need to design interventions that are uniquely African to address this challenge of climate change and to mitigate it and to adapt as required. I'm excited that COP is in Egypt because this is an opportunity for us to really discuss the impact of climate on the food and agriculture landscape and how we can collectively ensure that we protect a food ecosystem and, and develop proudly African solutions to this challenge. Number three is gender inequity. 
There are still huge gender gaps in the agriculture and food landscape in Africa. When we think about it, women are huge contributors in terms of primary production and retail. But when it comes to logistics and pro processing um, and large scale investments in the sector, we don't see women playing their rightful role. And this is linked to land rights, cultural biases, um, access to financing, where there's still a lot of um, challenge, as well as the limited access to markets. Any country, any continent that wants to really deliver excellence in food and maximize its potential cannot ignore 50% of its population. And we're seeing a lot of exciting trends um, and investments in trying to close this gender gap, and we need more. We need more, and we need it at scale. And number four, I would say, is really the challenge around productivity and processing. You know, our farmers are still largely subsistence and are not producing at the level of many of their counterparts all over the world. Similarly, we are still experiencing high rates of post-harvest losses with 40 to 60% of our fruits and vegetables going to waste, 20 to 30% of our grains, and we need to invest in manufacturing capacity across our value chain. So these are the huge barriers, but the good news is that there are many entrepreneurs at the forefront of solving this. Through my work with Nourishing Africa, we support entrepreneurs in 37 African countries, and we're seeing so many great innovations, so many wonderful stories. I profile them in my book on food entrepreneurs, and I'm excited about what many of our entrepreneurs will do to close these gaps. And uh, the World Food Program has issued its highest alert for catastrophic levels of hunger, and Nigeria is one of the countries mentioned there. What approaches or partnerships are you taking to improve food security and nutrition to help the more vulnerable markets? There are three approaches we're taking. Number one is that we're ensuring more collaboration between the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. No single entity can solve the hunger problem. We're seeing unprecedented levels of hoarding, of price speculation, um, and this is happening across the world. It's not unique to Africa. It's not unique to Nigeria, and we really need the private sector, the public sector, and civil society to share data, to be transparent and accountable, to do well and do good collectively. The second thing is that we really need to invest in homegrown solutions. This is not the time for WFP and other development agencies to pour food aid into Africa, to pour food aid into Nigeria, and to assume that there's no private sector already on the ground that they can work with. This is a time to say, what is on the ground and how can we support entrepreneurs in the seed industry, in the fertilizer industry, in the food processing industry to use local alternatives? And I'll give an example. Nigeria produces the most cassava in the world, right? At least the most cassava in Africa. And we rival many countries when it comes to cassava production. Cassava is a great alternative for wheat, right? What else can we do to shift diets to local alternatives? How can we improve the productivity of local alternatives? The same with turf in Ethiopia. Um, the same with Fonio, and the list goes on. And I think local alternatives and increasing the productivity and reducing post-harvest losses around local alternatives will ensure that in the short, medium, and long term, we continue to feed our people and feed the world. And number three, we need an investment in the infrastructure I talked about. Not only grain storage, storage facilities that are world-class, that are efficient and effective, we need to remove the bottlenecks in the entire ecosystem and ensure communication across value chains so that those who need food get it when they need it. And that efficiency and effectiveness and a low-cost approach will really ensure that our countries are a better place to take this action on their own and feed ourselves. And so I'm I'm excited about some of the new um, zeal I've seen on the ground at Sahel. We're having a conference in early September to actually get all stakeholders to map out how we can do this collectively more efficiently and more productively. And uh, I wanted to discuss, I know you've mentioned a little bit about climate change, but I wanted to discuss and get your thoughts on the uh, overlapping crisis, conflict, and the climate change. Um, you mentioned in your TED Talk that we have the technology and the science today to grow enough food to feed the world and to address our food waste problems. We have the knowledge, but we're not using it. As the co-founder of Ace Foods, in your opinion, what are the most effective strategies for improving food waste for companies? And what do you think companies should be doing to manage these crises without disrupting the workflow and to meet these demands? I really believe processing companies like Ace Foods have such an important role to play as catalysts, demonstrating what is possible. Now, what we've seen through our experience is that 
being a small and medium sized enterprise in the food ecosystem, you influence how farmers act because you're processing and you're sourcing from farmers. You also influence how consumers behave because you are in the middle. Some people call us the missing middle, but we're the most critical actors in the ecosystem. And we can show what it means to build sustainable businesses that are climate resilient. In terms of how we as companies behave, how we protect the environment, how we ensure that we do no harm, how we manage water and waste in our own facilities, how we teach our staff to be self-sustaining, but also to be climate champions, how we change the lives of the farmers, because we source from 10,000 farmers, at least Ace Foods, and all the SMEs collectively source from millions of farmers. So how we change farmer behavior because we are buying from them. So that demand-driven approach can enable farmers to become more sustainable in their use of land, their use of water, their use of seeds, and also more alert about the climate crisis and how to adapt or mitigate. And then how we change consumer behavior. Ultimately, consumers are critical to this climate agenda and ensuring that food waste is managed. Um, and I think communicating to consumers about how they use your products, how they use other products, helping them understand the linkage between farmers and them, and then also helping them act responsibly is critical. Um, and so it's a lot for a company to, to handle. Um, and that's why we need partnerships with nonprofits, with the public sector, to ensure that everybody acting together can move the climate agenda forward. I believe that there are lots of great innovations in Africa. You know, this term regenerative agriculture is now gaining steam all over the world. And as I've sat in meetings at the World Economic Forum and other places, I've said, well, Africa has a lot to teach the world about regenerative agriculture in terms of respecting the land, um, supporting soil, uh, minimizing the use of chemicals and fertilizer, uh, chemical fertilizer, uh, using organic fertilizer. We've been doing this for generations, right? Um, we were now taught to shift from our best practices to new practices. And now we're being told that the rest of the world wants to go back to what Africa used to do. Um, so I think terms like regenerative agriculture, we have to make it our own on this continent. And I think the food processors, the farmers, the logistics providers, the off takers all the way to the chefs, all will need to work collaboratively to ensure that food waste is minimized, that the concept of sustainability and resilience is embedded into our operating procedures, and that we as, as consumers also question where our food comes from and support locally grown food, locally produced food, and healthy food. Africa is estimated to be home to more than 60% of the world's remaining arable land, what agricultural opportunities exist in Nigeria that the rest of the world can benefit from? The amazing thing is that this, almost anything you put in the ground on our continent will grow, <laughs> at least outside the desert areas. And the same applies to the Nigerian context. Um, we have fertile land and we have the right temperature for a lot of tropical uh, produce. Um, so for me, yeah. there's unlimited opportunity. The challenge for us as private sector players and government is actually to prioritize uh, because there's just so much you could be doing. And I was the chair of the visioning exercise for Nigeria 2050 for agriculture, food security and rural development um, last year. And it was interesting, difficult to prioritize when you have such uh, ab an abundance of options. But we actually ended up prioritizing a few value chains, cassava, which I mentioned is a great substitute for flour, but actually is a staple in this country, but also has tremendous industrial uses. Maize, which is not only important for human consumption, but for poultry and for animal feed. We also prioritized soya because of animal feed as well. And for human consumption with protein, we prioritized tomatoes, yam. Yam is a great cultural product here, but it's also great for exports. We prioritized dairy and fisheries, um, as well as uh, poultry. So those were the priority value chains for food self-sufficiency in our country. Now, when we look at export-led growth, Nigeria is a leader in sesame production, in cashew, in cocoa, uh, in so many other value chains, ginger. We have some of the best ginger in the world. So when we think about export-led growth, there are different sets of priority value chains. Um, and the beauty of it is not just to export primary production, but to actually export well-packaged, high-quality produce for the rest of the world. And we're starting to see many more entrepreneurs packaging world-class products for the world.
That's amazing. I wanted to shift a little bit towards your other um, hats that you wear, Nourishing Africa and uh, Changing Narratives Africa. You're very passionate about creating opportunities for the youth, women, and farmers. What are some of the most proudest success stories that have come from supporting youth and women in, in agriculture? There are lots of success stories, and I'm just always so proud of many, many of our entrepreneurs who are doing amazing things. And I'll talk about two. Uh, one entrepreneur we support is uh, a woman called Yemisi in Ranluye. She owns a company called Saltry. And Saltry is a cassava processing company that not only supplies lots of companies locally, but also globally. Um, and she started both as a cassava farmer and then she has an outgrower scheme as well. Um, and her company is well recognized for being a catalyst and innovator in the cassava value chain. Um, she's based in Nigeria. In other parts of the world, we have entrepreneurs. In other parts of Africa, we have entrepreneurs like Lesogo Serlong, who is uh, an entrepreneur out of South Africa, and she produces beloved honey. And she works with indigenous communities um, and produces world class honey for the South African market and now exports. She's not only um, part of Nourishing Africa, but she's also part of Changing Narratives Africa. Um, in Kenya, one of our entrepreneurs in uh, Changing Narratives Africa has a pepper sauce company, um, which is just amazing. And his vision is to displace Tabasco uh, because he's actually grown indigenous peppers that are from his, his name is William, um, and he's grown indigenous peppers that are indigenous to his community in Kenya. Um, and through his company, he's also getting um, our products out there um, into local shelves, but also uh, global shelves. Um, in the Nigerian context, if we come back to Nigeria, we have two amazing entrepreneurs. One is Ebu. She does um, uses coconut to make not only body products that are world-class, but great coconut ball products that are getting onto global shelves as well. And her company is called um, Jam, the coconut company. Uh, we also have Afi, F. Young Williams, who has a company called Real Fruit that produces dry fruit and nuts for local and international markets. And Afi and Ebu have both female young women, but they also have mostly young women in their companies. In fact, Afi's company is 100% young women. Um, and through their value chains, they also support women as farmers uh, to supply produce to them. I could go on and on. Nourishing Africa works with entrepreneurs in 37 countries. It's a hub for entrepreneurs providing funding, information, data, market linkages, and support, enabling our entrepreneurs not only to scale their businesses, to trade with each other, to feed um, their countries, but also to feed the world. Um, and we are just very proud of the entrepreneurs who have benefited from the training programs we have, the funding linkages we provide, as well as the um, visibility that we continue to ensure that they receive so that the world knows who they are and they are celebrated locally and globally. Amazing. I think I, I Nourishing Africa is such an important uh, uh, business or like a organization because we do need these one-sided story narratives to change. It's, it's really a bit too late. So um, before we wrap up this uh, episode, I would like to hear from you. What do you think the African, the, uh, what do you think Africa's food ecosystem will look like in the ne next few years? And uh, what African products do you think should be on supermarket shelves around the world? Great. So the vision we actually put out there that we feel very strongly about is that by 2050, African entrepreneurs will not only be nourishing Africa, but nourishing the world. They would have scaled their businesses, leveraging innovation and technology to create a multi-trillion dollar industry that is profitable, but also ensures affordable, available, and sustainable food for Africans and for the world. In terms of what we want to see on global shelves, we definitely want to see in every single supermarket around the world, proudly Nigerian, Ghanaian, Ethiopian, Kenyan, Senegalese, the list is long, food, branded, proudly African. And we want to see jollof rice as popular as sushi. You can say Ghanaian jollof, Nigeria jollof, even Senegalese jollof, I don't mind which one you pick, but we want to ensure that jollof rice, which tastes so good and is healthy, is uh, as popular as sushi. We want to ensure that our fonio is as popular as quinoa, 
and we want to show that teff is as popular as white flour. But the same is with Moringa. We want people to know that when they drink rooibos tea, that is the hills of South Africa. It's not from some parts of England. It's actually from the hills of South Africa. And that, you know, couscous is from Morocco. I mean, we want them to every time they have a great meal to ask where is it from? And they find out there's a link to Africa to celebrate Africa's contributions to the global food ecosystem. We want sesame and cashew and everything you have, every coffee drink you have, you say, thank you, Africa. And that kind of changes the way you view us. It makes you realize that we are equals, we're contributors, um, and that farmers from our continent are feeding you on a daily basis with healthy, nutritious, and affordable food. And we want to build bridges with the rest of the world using food as a way to change mindsets. So I'm excited about what the future holds and I look forward to celebrating the successes of our entrepreneurs as we change the narratives and build strong businesses. I can't wait to, to have African uh, food and products on supermarket shelves. And um, thank you so much for your time today, um, taking the time from your busy schedule to join us. Um, if you have anything that you would like to leave with our listeners, please feel free, maybe where they can find you or anything coming up. Great. Well, I'd love to continue to engage with you. Um, my uh, Twitter handle is at Ndidi Muneli, Instagram Ndidi Muneli. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, there's definitely a lot going on. So please join nourishingafrica.com. It's a free portal. It has lots of data, funding, information, videos, um, and pl please join our mailing list because we sh want to definitely be part of your life and also support you um, as you build linkages with us. The same with uh, Changing Narratives Africa and Sahel. And I mentioned that in September, we have this conference on September 15th, which is a hybrid conference on how we can circumvent um, the food crisis in Africa um, and in Nigeria in particular. So we'd love for you to join. So more, many, many activities and many opportunities for collaboration. I look forward to working with all of you. If I could end with my favorite quote at this time, it's a Tibetan quote which says, if I tell you my dream, you might believe it. If I show you my dream, perhaps you might understand it. But if I involve you, it becomes your dream too. We want to involve as many people as possible in creating this dream that we have, where our children live full and meaningful lives. And that when you think of Africa, you think of happy, healthy children, great female entrepreneurs, uh, great products, and that you become part of this dream through the work you do, through how you support entrepreneurs and who, how you support African products. I look forward to celebrating together as we move forward together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ndidi. Um, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Let's Chew podcast as much as I have. And if you did, please share and leave us a review. Mm -hmm.